As an Amazon associate, we earn from qualifying purchases. This podcast is supported by its listeners. If you choose to purchase something using links on our website, we may earn a commission. No books were warped, dog-eared, underlined with purple pen, eaten, cursed, cancelled, burned or otherwise harmed in the making of this podcast. I'm Tom Tolkien and this is The School Reading List, a podcast that recommends books you'll want your children to read and books you'll wish you'd read as a child. To kick off episode four of the School Reading List podcast, let's rip open some book post. And first up, we have No Home for a Ghost by Jess Rose. This is a paperback from Owlet Press out this month. This charming illustrated picture book explores themes of belonging, homelessness, being afraid of the unknown and acceptance in a sensitive and reassuring way. When Dylan realises there's a ghost in his new home, mum and dad want it gone. But where will the lonely ghost go to? A useful text to discuss in EYFS Circle Time and Key Stage 1 PSHE lessons. From Otter Barry Books, we have The Perfect Present by Petter Horacek. Best friends Tom and Mott give each other a wonderfully imaginative birthday present. Tom gives a beautiful feather. Might it be from a magical bird? Mott gives a marble, or perhaps it's a tiny planet. The Perfect Presence is a highly creative and charming story with glorious and colourful illustrations. For EYFS and Key Stage 1 teachers looking for large display ideas, the multicoloured feather in particular will provide a wealth of inspiration. Mm. And new from Templar Books is The Best Bear Tracker by John Condon. A confident young girl is determined to follow the bear tracker rules and become the best bear tracker in the world. Children will love spotting the curious family of bears that follow her, undetected, throughout her quest in this hilarious picture book story for EYFS and Key Stage 1. If you're teaching instructional and procedural writing in year two or lower key stage two, the best bear tracker would make a great text for modelling and developing logical ideas. Together We Can by Ned Hartley, published by Studio Press. The 40 stories in this collection include the origins and history of the Black Lives Matter movement, the invention of type and printing, and Louis and Marie Pasteur's discovery of germs. Well-written vignettes of inspiration present true stories of challenge, teamwork and achievement. A meticulously presented hardback with vibrant and contemporary graphic illustrations, Together We Can is an uplifting and motivational book for Upper Key Stage 2 and Lower Key Stage 3 libraries. The Faber Book of Bedtime Stories by Sarah McIntyre. This diverse collection of new stories from cultures around the world features contributions from a stellar cast of contemporary authors, including Aisha Bushby, Kieran Larwood, Emma Carroll, Lou Quenzler and Natasha Farrens. Each tale promotes a sense of warmth, wisdom and positivity, A substantial hardback, the Faber book of bedtime stories is beautifully presented with colourful illustrations to share and discuss. It's the perfect gift for six to eight year olds and their parents. From HarperCollins, Meanwhile Back on Earth by Oliver Jeffers. When two children can't stop arguing, their dad decides to take them onto a journey through time and space. Looking back at the planet Earth helps to teach his children what matters, what makes us human, and what brings people together in harmony. Exquisitely illustrated, this hardback picture book is a wonderful achievement, 
both visually and in terms of the powerful and universal message, the sparse text is both thought-provoking and inspiring and will challenge the reader's views on the value of life and mankind's place in the universe. Highly recommended for reading and discussing with classes in Key Stage 1. Big Ideas from History by the School of Life. Thorough, in-depth, enticingly illustrated and thought-provoking, Big Ideas from History covers a diverse selection of civilizations and cultures. It doesn't simply explain the where, who and when. It focuses on the how and why and prompts children to think. Spanning prehistory, ancient realms, the Middle Ages, the early modern period, industrialization, the world of today, and predictions for the future, it's a substantial book in every sense. This 320-page hardback weighs in at over two-thirds of a kilogram. This is the perfect big book present for a curious upper primary or lower secondary age child. Published by Walker Books, The Search for the Giant Arctic Jellyfish by Chloe Savage. With all the right equipment, all the right people, and years of careful planning, Dr. Morley sets off to find a strange creature that no one has set eyes upon before. Will she be the first to spot the mysterious jellyfish? This hardback picture book is just spectacular. The stirring storyline, fabulous above and below seascape illustrations and cutaway boat details will provoke thinking, inspire action and encourage children to never give up. In particular, Chloe Savage's use of light and shadow to portray the incredible mystique of the giant arctic jellyfish is a joy to behold. A must-have for Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 libraries. And from Greystone Kids, we have The Museum of Odd Body Leftovers by Rachel Poliquin. This sumptuously illustrated hardback isn't like any other human body book. Framing our flesh and bone as a set of evolutionary artefacts, the reader is expertly guided by wisdom tooth and disappearing kidney, no less, around organs that are peculiar, unnecessary, and hark back to our distant past. The perfect present for children who want to be doctors or scientists, we particularly like the sections on nictating membranes, hiccups, and the disappearing human tail. It's absolutely fascinating. Mm. And from Nosy Crow, this book features on our Christmas topic list. We Disagree About This Tree by Ross Collins. In this sequel to There's a Bear on My Chair and There's a Mouse in My House, Brian and Mouse have reconciled until they try to work together to decorate the Christmas tree. Can they find a way to agree in time for the big day? Highly original with a heartwarming message of hope, resolution and friendship, this picture book hardback is an addictive and memorable rhyming Christmas story that younger children will want to read again and again. In particular, the illustrations are delightfully funny. I must wear sunglasses when I turn on the Christmas tree lights this year. From Neem Tree Press, we have The Terracotta Horse by Scott Lauder and David Ross. Salma Mansour hopes she'll never have to use her black belt taekwondo skills in real life, but that's before she's thrust into a time travel science fiction time slip adventure. Part of the Three Hairs series, the Terracotta Horse is a cracking middle grade novel with a fast moving roller coaster action dialogue driven plot. A heady mix of science fiction, ancient magic and life or death period combat, spanning thousands of miles and thousands of years, this will appeal to history and science fiction readers in Key Stage 3. 
And this one's a highlight on our October book club list from Piccadilly, The Ultimate Guide to Growing Dragons by Andy Shepard and Sarah Ogilvy. Grand High Dragon Master Thomas decides to create The Ultimate Guide to Growing Dragons, but it turns out that he and his friends Ted, Kat, Kylie Am and Aura still have quite a bit to learn. A highly readable blend of first-person narrative show-and-tell how-to style explanations, information fact files and messaging dialogue, the ultimate guide to growing dragons will be a valuable resource for Key Stage 2 literacy teachers. It's a fun text that will not only appeal to seven to nine-year-olds, but will help teachers to model those harder to reach informational genres in writing. Thank you to all the publishers and publicists for sending us books to review here on this podcast and on our website, schoolreadinglist.co.uk. Here's our rundown of great new children's books hitting the shelves this October. Lucky Bottle by Chris Warmel. The Haunted Hills by Burley Doherty. Tiger by S.F. Said. Aliens by Geraldo Maranci. My Rhinoceros by John Agee. The Search for the Giant Arctic Jellyfish by Chloe Savage. Wild Animals of the World by Dieter Braun. The Boy Who Lost His Spark by Maggie O'Farrell. The Boy Lost in the Maze by Joseph Colo. Freestyle by Gail Galligan. Ghost Light by Kenneth Opal. Children of the Stone City by Beverly Naidu. The Midnight Panther by Puna Mystery. The Other Ones by Fran Hart. Activist by Louisa Reed. Africana by Kim Chakanesta. The Three Hairs by Scott Lauder and David Ross. Creature by Sean Tan. Nomads Life on the Move by Kin Choi Lam. Big Ideas from History by The School of Life. Together We Can by Ned Hartley. Meanwhile, Back on Earth by Oliver Jeffers. We Disagree About This Tree by Ross Collins. India, Incredible India by Jasbinder Bilan. History's Biggest Show-Offs by Andy Seed. Basher Games Chess by Simon Basher. The Ever-Changing Earth by Graham Baker Smith. The First to Die at the End by Adam Silvera. Stealth Icebreaker by Jason Rowan. Escape from Chernobyl by Andy Marino. Sherlock Bones and the Curse of the Pharaoh's Mask by Tim Collins. And our picture book of the month is Goldilocks and the Three Crocodiles by Michael Rosen. Our non-fiction book of the month is 2023 Nature Month by Month by Anna Wilson. And our fiction book of the month is The Boy Lost in the Maze by Joseph Colo. Bookity book, let's get reading! If you're a teacher, librarian or avid bookworm who loves children's or YA books and you'd like to review brand new titles for the school reading list, get in touch by email. We'd love to hear from you. The address is reviews at schoolreadinglist.co.uk. (laughs) 
Promoting your new self-published or independently published children's book is not an easy task. We know because we receive, on average, 20 emails a day from new independent authors asking for a review or advice on how to get their books into UK schools. Even though we read all of these emails and we try to answer as many as possible, sadly, we're just not able to commit to reviewing every new title. Although we'd like to review everything, we have to be mindful of our limited resources and our readership. The School Reading List website is a recommendation website. It's important to us that the books we recommend are not only useful to teachers, parents, librarians and schools, but also widely available to them. It's no use us recommending a book that people are going to struggle to locate. So when we do recommend an independently or self-published book, it's not only essential that our readers will find it easily in a variety of bookshops, but also it's crucial that the book is widely available to allow recommendations and word of mouth to spread. Online retailers might have up to eight copies of a children's book at any one time. For bestsellers, they might stock 50 copies. If you were to try and order any more than that, many online stores will either limit the quantity you can buy or place the titles on back order. That's a real issue for schools, which might decide to buy a lot of copies of a particular title to cover a whole year group. In a small primary school, a year group order might be 30 copies. In a large secondary, that could amount to more than 200 copies. A physical bookshop might only have one copy available, but they can order in an unlimited amount provided the book is sufficiently in stock from a wholesaler, such as Gardner's. UKbookshop.org is particularly useful for schools because it doesn't restrict online purchase quantities. It uses gardeners for all of its bulk order fulfilment. This is ideal for schools because it means that any quantity of books in theory can be ordered. Additionally, there are still some schools stuck in the dark ages of using paper invoices for purchasing, and those schools are not always allowed to buy resources online using card payments. This is another reason why, to attract the school's market, children's books need to be widely available from a variety of online and offline sources. Our advice is ensure your book is available on all the big UK online book retailers, especially ukbookshop.org, Amazon and Waterstones. But most importantly of all, ensure your book is stocked by the big wholesalers and distributors, such as Gardner's. There's a guide on our website page on how to do that. Word of mouth is still the best approach to create a book buzz and promote your new title. But... Be sure your buzz is genuine, unsolicited engagement and not an echo chamber of confirmation bias. The first will buy your books. The second will cost you your books. It's essential to get evidence of real sales and evidence of a significant amount of quality, unsolicited engagement with your demographic market. Potential agents, publicists or mainstream publishers will be far more interested in real metrics than just noise or buzz. And if your goal is to continue to ramp up an existing self-publishing model, you must have real figures to use for your own projections and financial calculations. Counting the likes, retweets and shares isn't a good way to convince your bank manager or investors. Real sales and demographic metrics are... So a few tips on online marketing. Concentrate your efforts on securing new traffic, new readers and new sales. Try to garner web reviews on sites with high readership, a high reach and actual sales potential. For example, Goodreads or Amazon or larger niche market user-generated content sites such as Topster. Pursue Direct engagements with schools and school communities. Find out what they need. Ask them directly on social media. 
Offer free downloadable resources and relevant lesson plans built around your book. Be sure to target all age groups and abilities and make your content inclusive. Keyword your resources to ensure they appear in search results. Make your downloadable resources suitable for use as one-off cover lessons for mixed age groups and particularly supply teaching to ensure your activities are used and reused. Reply to social media requests for resources and advertise your content. Include homework extensions, competitions, home learning options and extracurricular activities to ensure your book extract and activity goes home. Include all resources on your website and social media so lots of people have access to them. Offer to speak in schools and do book signings before or after school. Advertise and promote these online. Offer to speak at school fates, PTA events. These can be advertised too. And if you have a sport, art, music or performance related book, offer to turn up and present at sports, arts and performance events. And these can be advertised also. Offline marketing is often still more successful than online marketing due to reach. School newspapers, newsletters, magazines, things that go home to parents must be considered. One large school's in-house newspaper or magazine may well have a readership of 2,000 plus. Think about getting featured in your local newspaper. Local papers have a 50k plus adult readership. Get interviewed on your local radio station. Local radio often has 250,000 plus in terms of adult listenership, often higher if they have on-demand content such as podcasts. And if you run an event or a competition, try to get your local TV involved. Regional TV can have a reach of more than 1 million in terms of adult audience. Things you might want to consider... Think about running a writing competition that makes use of your book. You can promote it on local media and to schools. We can help you promote it as well on our children's writing competitions page. Offer a prize that not only rewards the winners, but offers potential for publicity. For example, a writing workshop opportunity or the chance to name a character in the next book or a presentation event that offers entrance from lots of different schools to celebrate the competition. Offer to speak to or in schools about on-trend and in-demand issues in society and education that relate to your book. For example, bullying, discrimination, LGBT rights and protecting the environment. If you succeed with those ideas, the internet links generated should be enough evidence for you to create a Wikipedia page. And if you generate enough coverage and a Wikipedia page, you might be able to achieve a blue tick profile on social media platforms. Always consider who is likely to buy your book. Children don't buy books. Parents, grandparents and other relatives, schools and libraries and teachers buy books in that order. Depressingly, you need to focus most of your attention on the adults. If you do decide to give lots of books away, make sure they're signed. People are far less likely to throw away a signed book. Most important of all, it's worth mentioning what doesn't work in terms of children's book marketing. Niche market blog tours. Small-scale blogs tend to have very few readers, even fewer new readers, and even fewer readers for ultra-specific posts that quickly drop off the blog's front page, such as a review for your book. Consider how many people you expect to read a review of a book. A blog tour might result in less than 100 people reading reviews of your book. A click-through to purchase ratio of 1.5% is considered quite good for children's books. So is one and a half sales for organising a week-long blog tour worth it? Bear in mind you've given away seven copies of your book in return for reviews. Social media sweepstakes and giveaways. Now, these are classic examples of preaching to the converted. 
they offer very little real engagement, they won't result in the sales of your book. They will result in a lot of people following you in the hope of receiving a freebie. They'll also result in you giving away your book stock and paying a small fortune in postage. There's no hard evidence to suggest sweepstakes work as a book marketing tool and very little logic to even suggest that they might. Sweepstakes and giveaways are also a potential legal minefield if you don't know what you're doing. If you look at the CAP code guidance, which is on the article on our website, consider this. Do you have a robust system in place to safeguard data protection and GDPR and prove that your winner has been selected fairly and randomly? Ticking all the boxes for a giveaway is far more difficult and expensive than you'd think and offers very little, if any, marketing reward. And finally, be wary of confirmation bias from a bubble. It looks great and it feels great, but it won't fool anyone in the industry who wants to take a cold, hard look at real engagement metrics to try and derive an idea of the actual market sales potential of your book. So how can the school reading list help you with your new children's or young adult book? We're offering a free one minute new promotion slot on this podcast. And this is for unsigned yet to be published, self-published and hybrid published authors. You can record a voice only pitch for your book in 60 seconds or less. And you can send it to us as a WAV file or leave us an audio voicemail message via Skype. The details for this are on our website. We'll feature the best new pitches in our next podcast episode. Here's a selection of exciting new book tasters sent to us by new and self-published children's authors this month. Created for an art workshop at Penarth Library, the art family were designed to capture the imagination of young children as they explored their artistic creativity. Six happy characters, each with a unique style of line, matching their name. Smooth, curly, wobbly, dot, dash and spiky art. The magic colours, red, yellow and blue, are introduced to make orange, green and purple. With lots of colours and shapes, the art family has fun working together to paint all sorts of inspiring creative pictures, including exciting spotty monsters, big dinosaurs, posh poodles and woolly jumpers. There are a range of ideas for adults to build upon, encouraging children to create their own art family, with lots of other linked activities. Available from Amazon, written by Sue Trussler. If you'd like to get in touch and leave a recorded shout out about your upcoming self published children's book, have a look at our podcast webpage for more details. Earlier this month, we published the results of our favourite children's book survey. Educators, teachers, librarians and teaching assistants in 50 schools and educational settings across the country polled their classes to find out which books children had enjoyed the most over the past school year. Whittled down to 75 books and seven age group categories, you can read on our website what children love to read and share. If you want to know more about the polling process and the books chosen, the links are in the programme notes. So what do the results show us? What can be read into it? There's no evidential smoking gun. There's no goldmine of peer-reviewed findings. The results are very different to most of the typical teacher choices, including the recommendations on our site, but hopefully these top tens will get teachers, students, parents and schools talking 
about which books work well in their settings. Looking at what is popular and trying to explain why it's popular can be a useful starting point for discussions. Every school setting is different, and within each school, each cohort is different. If these survey results reflect your school, it's worth speculating and trying to unpick why certain books are popular to help develop and promote reading for pleasure further. If the results don't reflect your classes, it's also worth looking into why you think that is and how you can use those thoughts to further promote reading. At first glance, it does appear that children don't like to be told what to read. Advised, maybe, but not told. You ought to read this. You should have read this by now. You have to read this, otherwise you'll fail your exam, coursework, school career, entire adult life, etc. Can turn children off books. Reading bargains, inducements or contracts such as read this and you'll get this or read 100 pages today and you won't have to do this can be equally detrimental to independent reading motivation. It's interesting that very few, if any, of the books chosen in these lists are the type of books you would expect to have to persuade children to read. Popular titles are a gateway to reading more challenging material. Children don't like to be informed that what they choose to read doesn't have any value, or that they ought to be reading something better. A celebrity pen story, a film or game tie-in, or a supermarket-backed bestseller might not be what you want them to read, but it often reflects the child's world, dreams, and reality better than a teacher's pick. After all, as an adult, you wouldn't want to be told to put your Colleen Hoover away because you really ought to be reading Proust or Joyce. Strangely enough, children don't like that either. But left to your own devices, you might divert from Agatha Christie to Dan Brown to Ian Rankin and end up with P.D. James and Colin Dexter. Or you might do the reverse. It doesn't matter. Part of reading enjoyment is reading choice. And the magical risk of reading adventurously invariably requires both. Children are no different. Diary of a Wimpy Kid might segue into Tracy Beaker and develop into Anne Frank and later I Capture the Castle and A Thousand Splendid Sons. Where's Wally can lead to Journey by Aaron Becker, The Arrival by Sean Tan and perhaps viewing Rothko's Seagram murals at the Tate. Every book has value, and often that value is the sheer enjoyment and the power of choice. Interestingly, the most picked titles blend pupil choice, popularity, and at least a modicum of approval from teachers and parents. And even when teachers don't warm to them, the celebrity titles popping up in these lists are invariably books that are always on classroom bookshelves and in the school library. Can we speculate on why children chose these books? Is celebrity a factor? Do name recognition and brand awareness come into it? It is noticeable that a lot of the books featured are very recognisable. Familiarity seems to be a factor. Many of these titles are seen everywhere. Not perhaps seen by adults, but seen by children. School book fairs, supermarkets, at the airport, near toys and magazines, on children's shelves in bookshops and libraries, in magazines, on TV, on the internet, at school. At some stage, many of them have featured in World Book Day events. They have characters that children have seen people dress up as. In the case of classics, siblings, friends, teachers, parents have all read them. These are books that are already at home in the classroom or the library. They're not always purchased. They're books like the ones so-and-so has read. There's also name, brand and cover recognition to consider. Some books have covers that haven't changed in 20 or 30 years. Children know these books on site before they've even read them. 
Then there's the power of celebrity. It's worth noticing that out of hundreds of reviews on our site, the most read out of all of them is The Little Thing by Nick Cave. We thought it was highly original and interesting. So did hundreds and thousands of Nick Cave fans around the world. The knock-on effect is that people then started reading the other reviews mentioned in the If You Like This, Try This boxes. There's nothing wrong with celebrity books, and sometimes it's disappointing to hear academics and teachers put them down. What some of my colleagues referred to as those books should not be derided. Tie-ins and celebrity authors are children's literature's answer to Heineken. They refresh the readers that other books can't reach. They don't take away from other writers' sales. They tempt children who otherwise might not choose to read, they widen the market and form a first step towards reading for pleasure. Let's think about reading motivation. There are books that children want to read because friends, siblings or people they look up to have already read them. Or there are books they want to read first before everyone else. Sometimes there are books that children want to be seen reading. More often than not, the most popular books are part of a series. There's an anticipation to read the next one, get the new one, or find more like it. It's also worth noting that popular books are often cheaper and discounted. Does this make it more likely that parents will buy them? Is cost a motivating factor? There are many discussions to be had regarding the difference between books for children, in other words, what adults think children should read, and children's books, in other words, books that have taken off because they're popular with children. Choice is important. Maybe children rebel against what they ought to read and veer towards what they want to read. Perhaps they're more motivated to read anything but those books you ought to read. They're not worthy books. They're not literary. They don't have rich language. They do have car chases, bad jokes and formulaic plots. They're the children's answer to Dan Brown, Colleen Hoover and what was that last book you just read? Any book that's too cool for school is off to a flying start. Most of these books are not studied in English or literacy lessons or prescribed as reading books. Or if they are, the chances are that the child has already read them well before they've been asked to. Reading for fun rather than reading as work is one of the magic ingredients. Comfort reading is king. Children of all abilities do, at some stage or another, like to choose favourite books that are below their expected reading age, or not a particular challenge to read. They're not books that children will feel they will struggle with or need help with. They're stories that they have a sense of ownership over, literally and figuratively. Stories that are fun, feel good, imaginative, empowering, with good tending to defeat evil, happy endings that feed into existing interests, dreams and ambitions, tales that are rebellious, anti-school, portraying children as people in their own right, where fallibilities and insecurities are overcome and turned into superpowers. These are the winners. Doesn't everyone want to be a hero or a rebel sometimes? These winners have aspirational settings, seemingly better or more exciting than real life, Places that can be drawn, imagined, built out of Lego, talked about, riffed upon, and written about in stories that teachers probably won't like, but the rest of the class will. Don't we all need a feel-good factor at some point? What's particularly noticeable about the choices on these lists is the almost total lack of traditional class readers. This begs the question... Does studying a children's book kill any enjoyment that might be derived from it? Is the big novel study a big turn-off? There are a few notable exceptions. Harry Potter and Michael Morpurgo's Kensuke's Kingdom stand out. But are these books the exception 
because children have already read them independently before having to dissect them around the classroom, unpick them in comprehension tests and reread them for homework. Interestingly, once we start to look beyond the age of eight, when most readers are starting to choose independently, most of the book choices are titles children tend to read on their own. They're not class readers, read-alouds or books to share. They're books children can declare, I read this. Something else to throw out there is the small number of books in the survey results that reflect realities. Much has been made of children wanting or needing to see their realities reflected in what they read, often by well-intentioned adults seeking to redress their own childhood reading experiences. There's been a great push for publishers and schools to promote such books. However, this hasn't yet translated into sales numbers, or, if this survey has weight, reading choices. I really hope this well-intentioned push to broaden horizons doesn't backfire and turn children off. When it comes to looking at what children choose, what does appear to resonate is that children like to pick stories that don't necessarily reflect their realities. They favour imagined worlds, places beyond reality, with larger-than-life characters to aspire to and lifestyles to dream about. Perhaps children want a little more from their books than the dystopia of real life. In the instances where the story characters and settings have been promoted as texts that reflect realities, I have to wonder if the popularity is more down to fast-paced plots and good writing rather than what adults have decided is on trend. I do think it's important that these stories don't become books that really should be read, and end up being foisted upon children. Pressure to read can translate to a reluctance to read. This could result in some great new voices not being picked out independently by pupils. What's your view? Get in touch with your opinions. Leave us a voicemail shout-out using the link on our website podcast page. We'll feature a pic of the comments in a future episode. If you'd like to have a look at the results of the survey, there are seven pages to browse on our website, covering four-year-olds through to ten-year-olds. The links are all in the podcast notes. It's also interesting to compare the pupils' choices to our teacher and librarian recommended books for Key Stage 1 and books for Key Stage 2. If you'd like to get in touch, use the hashtag SRLpodcast on Twitter or drop us a line using the contact form or messaging button on our website, schoolreadinglist.co.uk. And all the books lived happily ever after. The End <laughs>